So iJet International's our tagline is operate globally with confidence. And how do we do that? We collect intelligence globally about health, natural disaster, geopolitical and civil unrest. And we capture that in a way that can be machine processable so that we can then identify your organization's exposure to risk. Um, our, over the last 10 years, we primarily focus on travel risk management. So if your workforce travels internationally, we help you um, keep your people out of harm's way. And if they happen to be someplace that is unsafe, uh, we can coordinate with first responders um, and uh, paramilitary forces or whatever is necessary uh, to get people out of harm's way. I work for iJet Labs, uh, the innovation center at iJet International, where we do all the product research and product development. So the product line challenges that we had when I started there were uh, it were around identity management and our legacy architecture. So there's an increased demand for federated single sign-on. Many of our customers already had an identi identity management solution in place. Um, they had different policies around identity management, password strength, multi-factor authentication, uh, and things like that. And we had to comply to all these different customers and satisfy them. And the only way we can really do that is to federate with their IDMS. Uh, and, then there, and then a desire for more security protocol options, uh, specifically SAML2 and OAuth2. And user self-provisioning. So when a user logs in using their own corporate IDMS, and uh, for the first time, it's redirected back to our systems, we can get the um, claims from that uh, third-party system and provision a user with their name, the email address, um, roles, and things like that that come from that third-party system. And that our other main problem was around our legacy architecture. Um, it just was not agile, it was not scalable, and uh, had limited revenue opportunities. And what I mean by that, we really couldn't monetize our main asset, which is our intelligence. And we wanted to be able to sell that uh, through APIs. So when I got to iJet about eight months ago and took on the endeavor to become more familiar with the current landscape, um, digging into the applications and what they look like, uh, this picture kind of depicts my feelings of this current state of affairs. I'm sure 10 years ago, it started off as a beautiful three-tiered application and database layer, business logic layer, and your UI. And then over the years, the business kept asking for more features and more capabilities. And what do you do? You just kind of bolt it on here and you bolt it on there. Um, and pretty soon, you have a very rigid system uh, that cannot pivot with the business anymore. So we wanted to move to a more service-oriented architecture. And so the uh, services were come in different sizes from uh, large components like uh, GeoServer, Alfresco, and LifeRay uh, to smaller components like our microservices that iJet will be developing or did develop, and other things like email, um, database. Uh, you know, everything does you know, separation of responsibilities, so everything does it well. Um, And of course, API management and identity services uh, provided by WSO2. So why WSO2? Uh, we felt that was an appropriate fit. The two main problems we had revolved around identity management and, and organizing our APIs, or providing secure access to our APIs as well. Uh, and it, uh, WSO2 uh, provides uh, great support. Um, and being open source, that aligns with iJet's values. Uh, we wanted to be able to take ownership of the products and deploy it the way we wanted to, and uh, WSO2 allows us to do that. And the product line, and being open source, uh, it's extensible. So we were able to customize the solution to meet our specific customers' needs. And then uh, the uh, quick start program uh, really was a great help for us. Um, it ensures that you get off on the right foot. Uh, they are, their engineers come in. 
understand what your business problem is, and ensure that you get the right architecture and uh, you know, are started in the right direction. So let me talk a little bit about the, uh, our, our process going through implementing WSO2's products for an end-to-end -end microservices architecture with federated SSO. The first thing we did was to uh, install Identity Server and start to configure the authenticators for federation. Uh, right out of the box, uh, it was pretty straightforward support for Azure and Office 365, uh, Active Directory, and Google, and there's many more authenticators that come right out of the box. Uh, we also needed just-in-time user provisioning, as I mentioned before, where the, uh, the incoming claims could be mapped to our local schema. And that worked uh, in conjunction with our custom user store manager so that uh, when, a, uh, when a user first logs in, those, we can create a, a user in our, in our very own uh, user store. And that was implemented uh, as an OSGI bundle. Now, we also had uh, legacy applications that needed to be integrated with Identity Server. Uh, so our applications were already configured to use another single sign-on solution. And you know, we had some constraints where we didn't want to change the code for those applications. So we had to create a kind of a bridge a facade between the way the legacy applications uh, authenticated and s with the old system so that they can now authenticate with the new system. And we used uh, Apache Melon to bridge the uh, SAML negotiation and provide that facade by generating the session cookie with the same uh, key value pairs that the old system was used to using. So now that we had the, uh, feder the identity server installed, uh, we worked on integrating API Manager uh, with Identity Server. It's pretty standard configuration, as far as I know, from WSO2, where the identity server becomes the uh, key manager. And um, we also had to write our own uh, handler for the Java web tokens. So when, once the application, once the user authenticates with Identity Server, and they get that OAuth token, the, the, the access token, that's passed into the gateway. And then the gateway then, at that point, negotiates with the Identity Server to get the user um, ID, um, the user roles, whatever other claims that, that the Identity Server has, injects that into the Java web token, and then p passes the request on, or the message on to the microservice. So that way, sensitive data is not passed over the wire, over the public wire. Well, once that in integration was done, we could focus on API Manager, um, you know, organizing our microservices in a better way. We use API uh, Manager to prototype our microservices version them, and then finally publish the microservices or the APIs provided by our microservices, as well as uh, manage client subscriptions. So we had actually several uh, customers and our own products each had their own subscriptions, which dictated which APIs were available to them and what kind of, uh, what kind of grant type they were going to use. The, the most important thing that we got out of API Manager, of course, was to uh, govern the access, uh, provide security to our, to our APIs. So it white, basically whitelists all, uh, all the access. And you, you have to whitelist your verbs, you know, put, get, post, delete. So I, I'm going to talk a little bit about our um, microservices architecture since this uh, talk is end-to-end. Uh, -end. It's an end-to-end -end case study. Uh, we, we used uh, the uh, hexagonal architecture or kind of the pipes and filters. So in the middle, at the core of it, is the business logic of the service. Uh, it performs a very discrete function, functionality. And around that, we have our adapters. Uh, the inbound adapters are going to our controllers packages uh, so that you can provide uh, hooks for administration as well as uh, 
you know, exposing the REST API that the user applications would access through the API manager, and then the outbound repositories. It's how the, uh, you know, the, the service then communicates with the database or per, you know, email, uh, centralized logging, uh, your, your uh, SIM tools, things like that. We also follow a, a template-driven development. So whenever we wanted to create a new microservice, we had a Maven archetype that would uh, create a, a Spring Boot application or a frame framework uh, with common instrumentation, uh, environment-aware configuration, such as your uh, different log levels, the different databases that it would connect to, whether it was in dev or test environment or production. Uh, we uh, had uh, the hypermedia controls already embedded into those microservices uh, so that, for example, pagination uh, links to other data. So if a microservice or, or if the data in the, in the payload references another object, it describes how the uh, application can access that, that object. So you have the URLs embedded in it. Embed also within our template was the uh, JWT security that was integrated with WSO2 and the, uh, the event framework integration. So we, had a, we came up with a common event uh, model so that uh, whenever uh, there's a state change event occurs, that event gets broadcast into uh, a common channel with all the other events. And then um, we can have other microservices subscribe to those events, sense them, and respond to them. And in the future, we want to look towards uh, complex event processing or the analytics, uh, the analytics server to detect uh, different trends in user activity. And that works in conjunction, of course, with the uh, common logging. So that logging is treated as a data stream that also gets integrated into our analytics. All of this uh, requires, uh, it required us to grow a DevOps culture so that the microservices could be, the in infrastructure could be scripted out. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, we, weren't, we aren't at the point of using uh, Docker containers yet, so each microservice does get deployed to an EC2 instance. Uh, so that's Am Amazon's virtualization. Um, so we created those EC2 instances for the WSO2 middleware components, the, uh, the identity server, and the API manager, and then each one of our microservices. We grew out our continuous integration and testing, uh, automation, all that was new to us. Uh, we previously were doing things very manual, uh, the build process, the deploy process. So we kind of took on a lot at the same time. But six months later, we, we had our federated SSO working. Uh, the API store and, gateway, store and gateway were up and running. Uh, we were able to build a new application built entirely on our REST, those REST APIs. And uh, those are now available for our customers to consume as well. And the legacy applications are able to authenticate uh, with the uh, third-party identity providers. So you know, our customers are now happy that they can use their own identity solution. Uh, this was not without its challenges. Um, I think our, our biggest challenge was that uh, WSO2's documentation uh, was lacking, uh, especially around the, uh, the, new, the new products like API Gateway. So uh, th there's a lot of hidden, hidden gems in, in, the, uh, in the code that uh, were undocumented. Uh, configuration options and features, which, uh, you know, as soon as we asked uh, WSO2 support, you know, how do we get this done, it was the, the response was almost immediate. However, uh, us being uh, on the, in the United States and most of our support engineers being in the, on the other side of the world in Sri Lanka, uh, something that would take five minutes to answer, sometimes we didn't get the answer till the next day. So that was a little bit of a pain point. Um, you know, I think I, 
one of the last keynotes that I watched on your lessons learned was to get WSO2, get, try to get someone on your team from WSO2. I think that would really uh, make, a big, make a big difference in ensuring the success of your project. So we tried to do too much on our, on our own. I think we spent a lot of time digging through source code, um, debugging, instead of reaching out to WSO2. So again, that's just, you know, take advantage of the support that they offer. And then we uh, really made a lot of changes in parallel. You know, moved to microservices architecture. Uh, we moved our infrastructure to Amazon Web Services. Uh, a lot of growing pains, moving from the manual processes to DevOps, having everything scripted out. Um, the, you know, a new identity server being stood up, a uh, new application platform, and, and the building of a new application. So we did that all at once in six months. And I, w I would recommend uh, try to take a more measured um, steps and you know, rolling, th rolling new things out. That's, I think that's the, uh, the again, that's the, kind of the lessons learned for us. But that, that's our experience. Um, implementing end-to-end -end microservices. <laughs>